we have come from pregnancy, now we have come to abnormalities in labor. We are coming to the last part of our course, which is the perpurium, and now we are talking about abnormal perpurium. So many abnormalities can occur during the perpurium, and there are some that you can read for yourself, and there are others that we will discuss. And perpurium infections are among the most prominent peripheral complications and are the major cause of maternal mortality in Ghana. So we realized that we said infections can also even lead to postpartum hemorrhage during the perpurium. This session will explain common abnormalities that can occur in the course of the perpurium and the various causes of trauma to the reproductive tract and their management will be explored. We will also be talking about circulatory and psychiatric disorders that will, can occur also during the perpurium. By the end of this session, I expect that you'll be able to explain the causes of trauma to the reproductive system, identify and diagnose tests in the reproductive tract, define the clinical features of the, of the common peripheral abnormalities, including the psychiatric ones. We'll discuss the common types of peripheral infections and their risk factors. Topic one, we are describing peripheral infections. Topic two, we want to look at the cause of trauma to the female reproductive system and their management. Topic three, we'll be looking at tests in the female reproductive system, and then we'll look at the peripheral abnormalities and corresponding management. This is our major readings. Types of peripheral infections. If you are looking at peripheral infections, there are a lot of them, like I said. We can't exhaust all of them in this topic because it can be a whole semester course. We will try our best to mention the very common ones, and there are other ones that you can read for yourself on the slides. Peripheral pyrexia is, an aura, is defined as an oral temperature of 38 degrees Celsius on two or more occasions during the first 10 days of the perpurium, excluding the first day. It is also defined as the rise in temperature to 38 degrees or more on two or more occasions 24 hours after delivery. So we are saying that sometimes immediately after delivery, physiologically, the woman may have some rise in the temperature. We are talking about peripheral pyrexia when the woman's temperature has gone very high to 38 degrees or more and then after the 24 hours of delivery. In peripheral pyrexia, there are so many causes. Peripheral pyrexia is just talking about increase in temperature. So, so many conditions can lead to increase in temperature during the perpurium. So, obstetric causes, we have genital tract infections, and then we can also come from breast infections. When the woman delivers and, and the, the baby's suckling reflex is not well developed, and the baby is finding it difficult to take in adequate food, the breast can be engorged, we can have mastitis, and subsequently, we can have infections in the breast during the perpurium, and this can give us increase in the temperature. Now, in all deliveries, we can have some normal or minimal cuts or scratches here and there in the genital tract. If the woman is douching and doing all sorts of things after delivery, the surfaces are raw, so you can have genital tract infections, also giving us pyrexia during the perpurium. Apart from these major ones that we are referring to as obstetric causes, there are non-obstetric causes. There are medical conditions that occur during the perpurium that can also lead to hyperpyrexia or peripheral pyrexia. So we have urinary tract infections or UTIs. The woman could also be harboring malaria, which will be manifested during the perpurium. She could also be having typhoid fever. It could be tonsillitis, acute appendicitis. We can have respiratory tract infections or other chest infections. And when the woman also have thrombophlebitis, she could have some pyrexia in the early stages of the perpurium. For any woman with peripheral pyrexia, we have said that peripheral pyrexia is just a condition that has increased in temperature. And it could be due to any of the things we have mentioned. So it means that if you want to look for the signs of peripheral pyrexia, depending on the cause, the signs may differ. So anytime you have a high temperature after the 24 hours of delivery or more, you then you have a rising pulse and other signs related to the cause. For example, in the genital tract, you can find that there is some discharge, some lochia, which is offensive. There is some tenderness over the uterus. If it is malaria, you know the signs of malaria, they will accompany the temperature. If it is, you can also find vomiting, joint pains, rigor, 
and you know that this is likely as a result of malaria. If it's a respiratory tract infection, is the woman coughing? Is she having any purulent discharge, any mucus coming from the nose? Is it offensive? So if it's a urinary tract infection, you can have dysuria, you can have polyuria or frequency of maturation. So what I'm saying is that in addition to the increase in temperature, the other clinical manifestation will tell you that this woman is having preparal pyrexia as a result of either respiratory infections of either malaria or genital tract infections. To diagnose this one, we need a thorough history because we want to find out if any of the things that we have discussed are happening. Is she urinating too frequently? Is the urine offensive? Is she having a vaginal discharge? You do a very thorough or comprehensive history covering all the systems. And then you take this history and then it helps you to know exactly what is the cause. In our management, at the district level, the midwives take the history like we have said, and then you do a rapid observation of the client, so that you, we, all you are doing is they want to find out the cause, because if you are treating pyrexia, just as a result of temperature, and you are giving antipyretics and analgesics, if it is being caused by UTI, as long as the infection remains, your temperature will keep going down when you give the antipyretic, and then once it wears off, temperature comes again. So you want to treat the cause of this peripheral pyrexia. You examine the client from head to toe to determine the cause. You examine the abdomen for any distension. Now you also check on the size of the uterus. If, if it has become big or it has become very soft, it tells you that there is an infection in there. Because after delivery, the uterus should be very hard. And then you inspect the lochia. The lochia is the discharge that comes after delivery, and the color changes as the perpurium goes on. So from the first day, it's very red, it should be becoming pink, and then you should be taking the alba color, and gradually it should be fading off. Now, if in the course of the perpurium, after it had become pink, instead of getting to whitish, it becomes red again, it tells you you're having peripheral infection, which is causing the pyrexia. You monitor the progress if abdomen is tender and then you want to find out has there been any improvement after 48 hours if there is no improvement is are there any signs of shock you give IV fluids and then you refer to the hospital so you do all these assessments you check malaria parasites if you have the facility within the you, where you are in the district or the clinic you check for malaria parasites you do every screening and then you refer appropriately in the hospital, if the woman comes and is having pyrexia, we also want to rule out any underlying cause. Is she sneezing? Has she got any signs of cold? Any painful breast? What are the other accompanying symptoms apart from the temperature that she is spiking? Any history of maturation with pain or urination frequently? We do all these things also in the hospital. You should also examine thorough evidence of any infection and look at the specific area where the infection is occurring. You do a further examination. You must inform the doctor about your findings and then you reassure the client and then the doctor comes in to do a further assessment. So you may do a check x-ray, you may take a swab if you suspect that there is any wound which is infected or you may take a vaginal swab for culture and sensitivity. You may drill out other conditions. You may do urea and electrolytes. Of course, you also do a high vaginal swab, a throat swab, a midstream mid specimen for urine is also done. So here you are doing differential diagnosis. You want to pinpoint at the exact cause. At the district level, you may only do some assessment to guide you. But here you do thorough lab investigations whilst we wait for a result. So as a routine, any time you find the infections, or if you are not even sure about the cause, once they give the analgesic and the antipyretics, then it follows with a broad spectrum antibiotics. Whilst you also continue with your IV fluids and continuous monitoring of the vital signs. The woman's personal hygiene is maintained. You render the general nursing care to this woman. You encourage increased fluid intake because it will wash the system. So if there are any toxins or even the heat, you want to take in more 
fluids, and then the doctor may perform a bimanual pelvic examination to check for any open cervical ulcers or uterine tenderness or subinvolution. Sometimes we also want to rule out any pelvic or abdominal mass. Specific treatment is given by the doctor depending on what was found to be the cause. But like I said, a broad spectrum of antibiotic when given can take care of all the ones that are coming as a result of infection whilst we wait for the results in 24 to 48 hours time and then we know the specific antibiotic to continue with. And then you explore the uterine cavity under anesthesia. You want to find out is there any retained product that is causing the condition. Now we have peripheral sepsis. Of course, peripheral sepsis also causes peripheral pyrexia. For the pyrexia, it is just the increase in the temperature and it could be due to peripheral sepsis. And peripheral sepsis is infection of the genital tract occurring after delivery up to the 42nd day or the six weeks after delivery. And it is important to find out which organism is causing this condition. And these uh, organisms are normally classified into two. Are they endogenous organisms coming from within or the exogenous organisms coming from without? The endogenous organisms are normally present in or on the body where they do not harm the body and have a particular role to play in the body. So, for instance, the E. coli is in the bowel. It doesn't cause any harm. But if for any reason it finds its way into the vagina, then it, can, it will cause infection. We have the streptococcus fecalis, and this also lives in the anus. And once it lives in its normal habitat, it has no problem there. If it extends and goes into the vagina, then we can have peripheral sepsis. Anaerobic organisms are those that flourish in the absence of oxygen or organisms. Or organisms in the dormant state, they are reactivated. So maybe they were there already, but they were hiding. If you go through labor, the stress and all that, and the immunity goes down, then during the puerperium, all these dormant organisms will rise, and then they will start causing sepsis. So the infection will normally occur where there is a breakdown in the tissue, or the tissue is bruised, lacerated, or there is ischemia and necrosis. For example, after traumatic delivery or following obstructed labor, you could easily have sepsis. And they, they are brought into the, sometimes when we are examining those women, the examining finger of the midwife or the instruments we use on the woman can bring infections from other parts of the body into the vagina and cause sepsis. In exogenous organisms, sometimes they are from other people. It can be from the ward and the organisms are transferred to other people or to other animals. Then the organisms are introduced into the genital tract from outside the body. It is usually transmitted by another person, like we said, and the source of infection arises from the midwife, the doctor, other attendants, or sometimes even the woman herself. And they can be spread by touch, by droplets infection, maybe through coughing. She wants to change the part. She goes to the anus, or she cleans herself from back front. And then she can also bring it, also cause the infection. We can have the hemolytic streptococcus, the streptococcus aureus, and then the chlamydia trachomatis. Pepper infection arises as a result of invasion and multiplication of an organism, and therefore does not occur until 24 hours or more after the delivery. So even if the organ was dominant and was hiding, after 24 hours, it brings it, it, it comes out. Or if the midwife or the doctor introduce any infections during the time of the delivery, because the organism will have to take time to multiply, then after the 24 hour, hours, depending on the type of organism, the signs may show. So what signs and symptoms do we notice with preparaseps with preparaseps? Pyrexia is the very first sign. We have said that it is one of the major causes of, of preparaseps. So of pepper pyrexia. So pepper sepsis will show as in pyrexia, and then usually the first sign that occur, and then we can have a rising pulse or tachycardia. The uterus can become tender on palpation, telling you that it is not contracting because there is infection. The lochia may be offensive. All these are signs and symptoms of pepper sepsis. 
there is delay in the rate of reduction of the uterine size. We know that when the woman delays with involution, the uterus tries to eat up its excess muscles that it built during pregnancy. So once the baby comes out, it doesn't need all that bulk. So we, there's something we call autolysis, where the uterus eats up its own excessive uterine bulk. If there is pepra sepsis, this process does not occur. Involution is delayed. So the uterus is still very high. And then you pass will be visible from lacerations and suture lines in infected wounds. And this will tell you that this woman is getting the infection from this site. After delivery, why women are prone to infection in the postpartum? Like we have said earlier on that there are always bruises on the genital tract. Even no matter how normal the delivery is, it comes with minimal bruises. This big head is coming through maternal soft tissues and of course some bruising will occur. Women are at risk of infection due to the following factors. Placental separation site becomes a raw surface where the bacteria can easily attack. And then the placental site is not too far from the outside of the woman's body. So now the uterus has come down. The site was at the fundus. When the uterus was big enough to the exifus tenum, it was too far from the outside. Now the uterus has come down and the placental site has become very close to the outside, very close to the rectum, very close to the neighboring organs. During delivery, women may have suffered tests, like we said, vaginal tests, perineal tests, episiotomy tests, other traumatized tissues, and it makes them prone. Anytime you have any retained products, blood clot states and uterus, it will decay in the course of time, and infection clots will be formed, and infection will be high around that. So any woman who gets a retained product is prone to developing infection during the perperium. Apart from that, if you had a retained product, it means that some manipulation might have been carried out. It means that we might have done manual removal of the placenta or DNC. And all these manipulations, the person attending to you could also introduce some infections. Poor hygiene. Then you're not cleaning the vagina too often. You're not changing the part too frequently. You can easily also get peripheral sepsis. And we have, as I spoke about manipulation in the birth canal, any manipulation that occurred in the birth canal, either for removal of the placenta, as we did for retained products, or for DNC, it's also lead to sepsis. If you have a presence of a dead tissue in the birth canal, the baby died in utero, we brought out the baby, but some of the dead tissue remain, just like we said for the placenta, then you are prone. Insertion of unsterile hand instrument helps into the genital, genital tract. Sometimes by the time they come to the ward, they themselves have inserted a different type of herbs prepared under very unhygienic conditions. So they become very prone to infection. If you have anemia, your immunity is very low. So of course you are prone to infection. If you have malnutrition, you are not eating well, you might have been having iron deficiency and you are prone to infection. Prolonged rupture of membranes, obesity and HIV predispose or women to peripheral sepsis. There are so many risk factors, multiple vaginal examinations, cesarean section, manual removal that we have mentioned some, and there are a lot of them. You can just continue reading the list. For investigations, a full general examination is important. You do a high vaginal swab, a midstream specimen for urine, for culture and sensitivity, hemoglobin estimation, and then you may also do a pelvic scan. If you do a pelvic scan, you will find out if there are any tissues, any retained products in the uterus. At the district level, you welcome clients, you relax the client to take a comprehensive history, as we do in all the cases we've been discussing so far. If the woman is talking about discharge, then you assess for the degree of discharge, the color, the odor, the amount. If there are any tests, you also look at the test and also check for any lacerations. You examine the abdomen for any tenderness. You give oral amoxicillin or any other broad spectrum antibiotics. And algexis are administered. Paracetamol could also be given to relieve the pain. And then sometimes you may be given antipyretics also to take care of the temperature. You take the blood samples for grouping and cross-match. 
you rule out are there any malaria parasites also causing this so you do i try to have a differential diagnosis you monitor progress if the abdomen is tender or condition is severe there is no improvement 48 hours you have to refer this woman remember that during these 48 hours this woman should have been under antibiotic coverage and then you organize for blood donors you accompany the woman to the next referral site now if you get to the site sometimes they can also come to the site so we do all that we have done and then we continue to do some more in the hospital the doctor may prescribe the following medications she may need some pethidine some diclofenac still on antibiotics she may review the antibiotic that was given at the district level depending on the results or the outcome of the culture and then these are the common antibiotics that are given gentamicin metronidazole cefrazin amoxiclav and now they give them in combinations so you can give find a doctor giving multiples of antibiotics so that they can cover all the species of bacteria that could be causing the sepsis so we take a swab for investigations and then you also encourage personal hygiene you tell the patient to take a nourishing diet and then you encourage intake of fluids surgery may be done in some cases you may have to do evacuation of the uterus if there are retained products there are times that there is a need to do laparotomy to drain any pelvic or peritoneal abscess and then a colpotomy may also be done to assess for any pelvic abscess now there is a condition we call metritis and it's also an infection metritis is just saying that the endometrium is inflamed so you want to look at the enlining of the uterus to find out any inflammation now for all these conditions the treatments are similar they are all pepra sepsis and their managements are similar the clinical manifestations are also similar characteristically all those that have infection will have pyrexia as a major indication so the, the, the investigations are the same and then effect of genital tract infections they can have pelvic infection they can also go to the affect the perineum so perineal infection we can have cyponjitis where this infection carries up the uterus and then now they go towards the fallopian tubes so we can have inflammation of the fallopian tubes as we refer to as appendicitis, it can even lead to infertility. If sepsis is not controlled very well, then we can have infertility because we, we, we not only have appendicitis, but we can block the fallopian tubes, and then we can also have scarring of the fallopian tubes. We can also have peritonitis as a complication, and this is because the infection will spread to the peritoneum. We know that the, there is a peritoneum lining which is called perimetrium which covers the uterus. So that part will be the first to be attacked and then it spreads to other parts of the peritoneum. We have pelvic cellulitis may also occur and then we have septicemia. When this infection is severe, now it can may be carried along the bloodstream and we may have the whole blood being contaminated with the infection. And you can also have what you call hemolytic anemia. If you want to prevent peripheral sepsis, start right from the antenatal. Anything that will lead to a reduction in the human's immunity can also lead to peripheral sepsis. So build a good immunity at the antenatal level, and by this time you are familiar with all that we do at the antenatal level to build a good immunity because we have discussed them over and over again. During labor, you also want to prevent inf any infections, so you conduct labor under aseptic conditions. Everything you bring to, the, to take care of the woman should be very clean and those that should be sterile should also be sterile you also have to avoid you know that prolonged labor always leads to infections once the membranes rupture then we have ascending infections so you avoid prolonged labor so during labor too you also want to make sure that blood loss should be minimized when she loses too much blood then she becomes immunocompromised episiotomy should be given at the right time if you give episiotomy too early, you expose the incised part also too early, and then you may have some infection. And then the midwife should be skillful, should do a skillful delivery to avoid trauma. For example, maintain flexion. You know when to flex the fetal head, you know when to extend the fetal head, and you follow accordingly. You observe for signs of infection, 
very early and you take precautions. Make sure that all the sepsis or aseptic procedures that you have to carry out, you observe them, when to do hand washing, when to give prophylactic antibiotics. We said that once the membranes have ruptured be beyond 12 hours, you don't wait, you give antibiotics even before you draw the attention of the obstetrician. The staff with infections, if you have cold, you shouldn't go to the labor ward, you shouldn't de deliver the woman, you call somebody else to attend the woman. Hand washing, very important before applying the perineal pass so that you don't introduce any infection to the site. And the perperium, you continue with the hand washing, you educate this woman to observe good hygiene practices, good diet, and all these things will help prevent peripheral sepsis during the perperium. Sometimes the pad is expensive and changing the pad becomes a problem. If they want to use their local cloth and they can maintain it very well, washing very well, ironing before use, you don't prevent them. It is better than they keeping a pad a whole day and making the place septic. Now we have breast infections that occur during the perperium. We refer to them as mastitis and it is inflammation of the breast. Now inflammation of the breast can graduate to other levels of infections that I'll be talking about. So it can start with a simple infection. Now an abscess can now be formed even in the breast. So mastitis is just inflammation of the breast and it's usually due to bacteria infection. The incidence is about 2.6 to 3.3% and the causes of mastitis is typically when the milk is not being regularly and properly expressed. Remember we said earlier on that when the baby is born, the baby is now trying to learn how to suckle and especially if the baby is not very healthy or if the baby is a, prime, is a premature baby, then the suckling reflexes are not very mature. So suckling becomes a problem. And because the baby is not feeding well, the mother's breast becomes engorged. And once the breast becomes engorged, then the inflammation process stand, comes in. It has also been suggested that blood nipple ducts can occur as a result of pressure on breasts, such as tight-fitting clothing or bra, restricting the breast. Sometimes so the baby is just not attacked very well. So if you give the nipple to the baby to suckle, there is no breast milk in the nipple. The breast milk is in the areola, the space after the nipple. So if the baby doesn't feed well, then the breast will become inflamed if you don't put, fix the baby well. When the baby has infrequent feeds or has problems with suckling, then mastitis can occur. So the bacteria, of course, may come from the skin or the baby's mouth, and it will just enter the breast duct, and that is mastitis. So if the risk factors is that if the breast is intact, it's difficult for it to become infected. When you don't fit the breast well and the nipples are cracked, then it becomes an opportunity for the microorganisms to enter and cause mastitis. If the woman had a previous history of mastitis, find out what happened and then take precautions. Women who wear tight fitting bra and restrict milk, we have said that already, are all risk factors. And when the woman is also a diabetic, all diabetic mothers have a risk for mastitis. So we can have two types, non-infective and then the infective type of mastitis. So non-infective mastitis occurs when the milk flow from one segment of the breast is obstructed. So for some reason the milk is not flowing. So if the milk is not flowing, then the milk itself within the, the breast is causing the inflammation. And this is not coming from outside. It's coming from a blocked duct or a compression or poor positioning. In the infective mastitis, it simply means that this inflammation is being caused by an or organism. So there is a bacteria that has entered through either a cracked nipple and is causing the infection. Common causative organisms and mastitis, we have Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermis and Streptococci. For the clinical signs, you can have the fever very high, shivering and chills. It is an infection. So all the signs of infection are present here, including reddening of the breast. And the woman may complain of throbbing pain in the breast. She feels like as if the breast is pulsating and the pain is so burning and the nipple may be cracked. The breast may also be engorged, full of milk. And then axilla glands may be enlarged. So if you check the woman's armpit, you realize that all the, the glands are enlarged, trying to 
deal with the pain and the swelling in the breast. And the woman feels generally unwell. They have general malaise. She's anxious and stressed and complains of fatigue. And she may get flu-like symptoms in addition to the temperature. The mode of transmission, we have said that normally through a cracked nipple or any exposed part of the skin. So you carry out investigations. You take a sample of the breast milk for bacteriology in the lab. In the health center, we take a good history, a reassurance, like I've always been saying, monitoring the vital signs and do a good examination of the breast. Is there any mass? You refer immediately. If there is no mass, you give painkillers by oral application. You also give antibiotics and then you encourage increase in the fluid intake. You do tepid sponging when necessary. You encourage the woman to continue breastfeeding or expressing the milk unless there is pus. If there is pus in the milk, then you don't give the pus to the baby. You support breast with a binder or a brazier. If you leave the breast to hang, it becomes more painful. And then you may apply a cold compress to the breast between feeding to reduce swelling and pain. You monitor if there is no pain. If there is no improvement, then it means you have to refer to the hospital. Now, if the woman comes to the hospital with this condition, we examine the client, the doctor performs all sorts of lab investigations, and then you advise the woman to continue breastfeeding like we did earlier on, and we take care of the temperature. We also give our medications, and we monitor the type of bacteria causing the organism. Now, if for some reason the mastitis is not well controlled, then you have a condition we call breast abscess. In breast abscess here, it has gone beyond ordinary infection to the fact that an abscess is formed, and here it may be a pus producing abscess. So breast abscess most commonly affect the skin of the lower half of the breast and often recur in women who are overweight, have large breasts or poor personal hygiene. The complaint of breast pain, tissue becomes tense, it's just like the mastitis, there's nipple discharge, tender or enlarged lymph nodes in the axilla. Below the nipple surface, you can have the lactiferous ducts. They form large dilatations called the lactiferous sinuses, and this act as milk is avoided during lactation. Now, when this lining is infected, it undergoes changes, and then becomes what you call keratinized. And when it becomes keratinized, an abscess is formed. In the health center, in the community, we take a history of what is causing this woman. Is she breastfeeding well? You give analgesic and antibiotics and you refer. Breast abscess always need further management. So once you observe and you give the initial analgesics to suppress the pain, you refer this person immediately. You encourage the woman to drink copious fluids. In the hospital, there may be the need for surgical incision and drainage of the abscess. So during this time, the baby will not be breastfed. And then we give analgesics, and then you treat, you also give your midwifery care accordingly. And it may not be possible to feed from the affected breast, like we said, for a few days. So we remove the abscess, and then the correction is made. Once the infection goes down, the woman can go back to breastfeed. We want to look at trauma, traumatic complications. Here we've spoken about them over and over again. So we just want to mention them. We have tears may occur at any level of the birth canal. We have trauma or injury that can occur to the woman. We have said that we could all even have a psychological trauma, depending on how the midwife even handled this woman during delivery. If she gets a psychological trauma, she'll be developing some of the psychological problems we'll be talking about later on. And she should also assess trauma to determine if she's capable of and it's allowed by law to switch her, or she needs to inform the doctor. So depending on the extent of, of the trauma, some lies within the jurisdiction of the midwifery practice, others go beyond, and the referral is necessary. We know that during delivery, it can be as a result of the fetal head, and then we also mention manipulations during delivery. We can have degree of test, first degree, second degree, third degree, and presently we even have the fourth degree tear. And this degrees, the, the, the tear takes its name after the degrees, depending on the extent of the damage. 
So for instance, if it is mild, it is around the first degree. If it is very severe, then we are going to fourth degree. So the higher the intense or the organ, the severer the effect on the woman, then the higher the degree. So if we say a fourth degree tear, it means it is the worst form of tear. So in the fourth degree tear, it is not just about the peri perineum. It's going to affect even the anal sphincter. And sometimes some rectal mucosa is even involved. For the first degree test, it could be managed by the midwife. Third and fourth degree test, there is extension of the soft tissues which occur during delivery. There is damage to internal layers of muscles and sometimes blood vessels are also involved. There is bruising and edema of the perineum. If the tests are not repaired, there will be incontinence of flatus and loss of stool. And then if due to rectal vaginal fistula. Trauma to the service and extended tears to the vagina can occur. Cervical tears most often occur on the sides. And then when we want to measure cervical tears, we use a clock. So the center of the service, that is the odds, becomes the zero. And then if you trace the odds straight up, we're just using a, a, a clock like a watch. So the round service cervical odds becomes your clock. And then you indicate where 12 o'clock is, where 6 p.m. is, where 3 p.m. is, where 9 p.m. is. And then using that clock, you'll be able to describe exactly where the tear is occurring. So we can say that this cervical call is at 9 o'clock and the midwife knows exactly where the cervical tear is. Or the cervical tear is at 12 o'clock. It means that if you look at the horse, you go just on top of the horse upwards, you will find the tear. So how do we diagnose the cervical tear? The client will continue to bleed. And this bleeding, we have said that the uterus will be well contracted, telling you there is no retained product of conception. It is just coming from a laceration, pain in the vagina, and then the bleeding that we mentioned earlier on. So if you come to the treatment, what stage is it first degree or second degree? If it is important that all perineal lacerations are repaired immediately, whatever the degree is, because as long as the surface remains raw, the tendency to develop further peripheral infections or sepsis is very high. So you do an operation by an experienced surgeon obstetrician and under general anesthesia, and then you carry out the repair. So you do a general examination, looking at where the tear is, then you suture with a cut gut or other absorbable sutures, because you may not go up there to remove the suture. Various layers are sutured carefully. And then if it's first degree test, usually under local anesthesia, you could suture is second degree test are also sutured under general anesthesia by the doctor. Then you render continual care, promoting healing, preventing infection, providing total midwifery care to this woman, relieving pain and providing comfort. You could also use in infrared heat this is comforting and it promotes healing. The perineum is exposed to heat for periods of 15 minutes twice daily. And careful hygiene should also be maintained together with our infrared. And then the client is encouraged to use the bidet if it is available. Warm saline set bath may also be done. In the set bath, we don't want the woman to put water in the bucket and hang on it. The temperature should be warm. It's not a hot sit bath. So if it is too hot that the woman cannot sit in the water, then it is not a warm sit bath. In the warm sit bath, the temperature is conducive and the woman can sit in the bath. And we, we also add some saline. You put in the saline before you boil the water. So that if there are any microorganisms, even in the saline, the temperature can take care of it. The perineum should, however, be dried after bathing. So anytime you finish the sit bath, you dry the place before you apply the pad. It shouldn't be a hot set bath. Lukewarm water should be used. If you use hot water and there are any sutures, then you could melt the sutures. The mother is encouraged to walk about as much as she is able to because when you walk, you encourage involution and that will also help. And she may use air ring or cushion when sitting down. It's difficult for them to sit down because of the pain. So they may sit on a pillow, especially when they are breastfeeding. 
they will get the after pains. The sitting is uncomfortable, so the mother is advised to lie on her side in bed and feed their babies. Because once you sit down and feed, you feel the pain right in the over or perineal area, and it's very painful. If the wound becomes infected or sloughing appears, then some of the sutures may be removed. So you remove the sutures so that it can make way for the pus to come out. The client is encouraged to take adequate nutritious diet, and then you continue with monitoring of the vital signs. You examine client for pallor, you examine abdomen for tenderness, and then you check for other signs of infections. You give a low residue diet to this mother, and after three days, a glycemic suppository is given if there is constipation. You also want to avoid strain as tools, especially if the woman has sutures. And then you give a high residue diet in order to produce bulky stool, which is easier to expel. Complications is rectal vaginal fistula. Like I said earlier on, we can have so many other things occurring in the perium, like an infected episiotomy. So you can do a further reading and read on the infected episiotomy. And then you can also read on the thromboembolic disorders. Remember that because of pregnancy, the woman has a tendency to develop thromboembolic disorders. And once this happens, you should be able to manage this condition. Even just position of the woman will help you to prevent thromboembolic disorders. If for some reason we couldn't manage the woman we could doing antenatal and doing labor and it occurs, then there is a need that we manage this because this can also lead to pyresia. It can also even lead to shock. So it can have a, a, a formation of a thrombus. We can also have flebo, we can also have thrombophlebitis where it is not just the clot, but there is also inflammation of the lining of the blood vessels. We can also have inflammation of, a, of the lining of the vein with clot formation all together. The predisposing factors, when you have caesarean section and you had to rest for a long time, without any, any mobility, then the thrombosis could be formed. Any woman aged over 35 years also have a tendency for developing thrombosis. Highly parous women also have a high tendency for thrombosis. The use of estrogen to suppress lactation has also been associated with thrombosis. For non-obstetric causes, we have obesity, smoking, immobility, trauma to the legs, previous deep vein thrombosis, any familiar history of thrombosis, prolonged bed rest during pregnancy. Some get people to take care of them and they feel so pampered and they remain in bed throughout pregnancy. But remember that the end product is thrombosis. Prevention is activity and exercise and you want to prevent trauma to the lower limbs and pelvic veins so that you don't have any clots forming and entering into the bloodstream. Careful handling of the legs, you avoid pressure from the legs. If the woman is also in labor and you are using the totomy position and you are using the stirrups, if you keep her in the stirrups for a very long time, then you are also increasing the tendency to develop thrombosis or clot formation. Prophylactic treatments in women whose history suggests that they are predisposed to this condition, we give low doses of anticoagulants. Remember that we emphasize on very low doses. Anticoagulants are anti-clotting. So if a woman is pregnant and you're giving anti-clotting, you are destroying the pregnancy. That is why we insist on very, very low doses of heparin or any anticoagulant. Identification of early signs of thrombosis, examine the woman's legs. In our postnatal clinic, we do examination of the legs, but sometimes we don't tell them the reason why we're examining the legs. Because sometimes the thrombosis will start with painful calf muscles. And once you educate this woman, once she gets the pain, she knows that I'm going to develop thrombosis. I have to head towards the hospital. We can have a superficial thrombophlebitis and we can have a deep vein thrombosis. You've done all these conditions in medicine, so I presume that you know all the clinical manifestation of this condition. But most importantly, the vein becomes very tender and there is increase in temperature. For the management, you reassure the woman and you, ap you apply elastic stockings so that the clot is not flowing in the blood vessels. You leave the clot to flow in the blood vessels at the point it may dislodge and get into the heart or any vital organ. In any organ that it lodges in, 
will have an organ failure. If it gets into the heart, you can have a cardiac failure. So we wear the stockings and we restrict the cloth from moving. Now you encourage exercise and you always raise the leg when you are sitting, the woman is sitting down and you advise against crossing the legs. So the woman should not sit and cross the leg. If you sit and cross the leg, the point where the cross, the legs are crossing, it interferes with venous flow. And once that happens, you are prone to developing thrombosis. So like we see, we've talked about, we have superficial and we have deep vein thrombosis and you've done all these things in medicine. So we can go forward. You can still spend time to read on the deep vein thrombosis and the superficial thrombosis. Their signs and symptoms are similar and their management are also similar. And it is managed just like we manage them in medicine. So we also have management at the district level and also at the hospital. Right, so we want to end with our psychiatric and psychological disorders of the perpurium. There are a lot of psychological conditions in the perpurium. You should be able to differentiate between the maternal blues, which are not very serious, and then also note maternal, differentiate between maternal blues and, or postnatal blues, postnatal psychosis, postnatal depression. Maternal blues are also referred to as postpartum blues. Some also refer to it as baby blues or third day blues. And this is just a mild transient change of the mood of the woman in the first week after delivery. Normally within the first maybe three days or three to four day of delivery. It comes as a result of the stress of the pregnancy and also the stress of the delivery. But it is not life threatening. If the woman is giving just some little support, she's able to come back to her normal. So you know that the, the hormone levels are very high during pregnancy. And these hormones also cause emotional imbalance. So when the woman has delivered, his placenta is out, estrogen supply is cut down, and then progesterone is also cut down. Other hormones also come to play. That transition leads to some labialness in the woman's emotions. So we have said that it is transient. It is not life-threatening. It doesn't call for any serious concern. So the clients may you just go and find a woman weeping in the bed, or she is restless, or tells her have a very severe headache or anxiety. Sometimes she becomes offended at the least provocation. Madam, how is your baby? She will not even mind you. Or she's okay. And you can look at how the woman is, from the way she's talking, that she's going through some postpartum blues. And then she has mood swings. She's happy one moment. The next moment, she is very angry with you. And the midwife, with your knowledge in obstetrics and psychology, should be able to manage this woman without getting angry at all. And you should be able to support the family to be able to cope with the changes occurring in the woman so that she's not deserted by the husband or any caretaker. Because if that happens, it worsens it. And then it goes into something else. So find out the possible cause, do continuous observation, make sure that you are ruling out any serious psychosis and it is just the blues. If it becomes psychosis, then she needs some care. If it is just the blues, tell the family to be sympathetic and understanding. The husband may come, she may insult the husband or sack the husband. You tell the man that she is going through some transition and she'll be fine. Now we have postnatal depression. This is a very severe form of psychiatric problems in the perpurium. About three, 10 to 15 percent of deliveries are affected by depression, and then three to five percent of these women will be affected by more severe forms of depression or, de or depressive illnesses that will necessitate their going for psychiatric management. The predisposing factors, adolescents, some unmarried but have given birth. Some also even were raped. And then the family, somebody from a family or when they have a very low self-esteem naturally, then they are also prone to having postnatal depression. It can affect all age groups, all social classes. The poor and the rich can equally be affected by postnatal depression. And then patients with emotional instability, some by their personality, they have emotional instability. This type of person can just go to postnatal depression after delivery. 
Like I said, you know, wanted pregnancies. Maybe pregnancy too. Everybody saying, oh, so soon you've gotten pregnant. Your baby is not even crawling and you are pregnant again. All these things give them some precipitate, some form of depression. Social and financial problems can also precipitate. And sometimes dissatisfied educational achievements. She was asked to go to school, set a certificate. She brought a baby. So it all leads to some, there's, there will be problems in the house. Parents are angry. And all these things can lead to depression because the, the person herself is not satisfied. I couldn't finish my education. So it becomes a predisposing factor, more prone to developing psychosis during the proprium. Patients who are separated from one or both parents in childhood, sometimes at this level, some f reflections come back. They remember their childhood pain and all that, and then they go into depression after delivery. They have stress like moving house or changing their career just around the time of delivery. Something happening can also give them depression. High levels of anxiety, personality traits, previous postnatal depression. If the woman had a post previous postnatal depression, subsequently it will deepen. She is going to have higher forms of postnatal depression. And if she, if she had a history of self fertility and she suffered so much before, getting this baby. Now it comes with excitement and emotions and she becomes depressed. The onset is gradual and the condition may last for three to six months. In some cases, it persists throughout the first year of the baby's life. You should know that if the woman is having depression, she feels tired, exhausted. She's not dying any anytime. Oh, feed your baby. I'm tired. She can't sleep. She tends to blame herself. She has a bad, she's been a bad mother. She has difficulty coping with the baby. Management early detection is important. You have to reduce stress during pregnancy and during labor. You should be able to identify any woman going through stress at the antenatal level and intervene before she comes into labor. Stress should be reduced by providing continued help. You should educate the husband and family to understand the woman's illness. They should be counseled to avoid making excessive demands upon the depressed woman. She's already depressed, she doesn't want to feed. Feed your baby. Sometimes there'll be the need to bring in some other meal to support the feeding. You plead with her if she's prepared to feed. You feed if she says, I will not feed. Don't condemn, don't be hard on her. You find something else to, supple to, to supplement what she's taking from the mother. And then you allow the mother to ensure good rest. You inform the doctor whenever she, you suspect placenta depression immediately, and then you prescribe mild tran Don't wait for it for her to start beating up nurses or throwing the baby away. You should be able to pick the signs very early enough. You give mild tranquilizer, so she is always under some sedation, so that she is not able to either fight or harm the baby. And any antidepressants may be described, and then the client is also treated with psychotherapy like counseling, or sometimes in severe cases, you may have to visit the psychiatric hospital because that it becomes a very severe form of it. The last one is peripheral psychosis, which is a severe form of mental illness occurring as a result of pregnancy. The risk factors are primiparity, past psychiatric history, family history, psychiatric disorders. It starts with within four weeks at the baby's birth with restlessness, it tells her, I can't sleep, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. The next moment when you don't intervene, she will deny that a baby even belongs to her. In rare cases, they even harm the baby. Sometimes they kill the babies through suffocation. You find the baby crying, you go, mother is pressing baby with a pillow. If you don't intervene, baby dies. And they may have suicidal thoughts. If they want to kill themselves, so that, just like they want to kill their babies. It lasts for about three months. And the midwife should measure their clients and relatives, should reassure the clients and my relatives and refer to psychiatric units immediately. So you, you tell the obstetrician and then he does the referral. If it is possible that the baby will be able to accompany the mother to the psychiatric unit, it should be encouraged, but then under close supervision. The fact that we want to encourage breastfeeding by all means doesn't mean that we should leave the baby for the mother to kill the baby. Especially if she says that the baby is not her baby, then she can throw the baby away at any time. Clients are treated with major tranquilizers and antidepressants. These are references and this brings us to the end of our discussions on the abnormalities during 
the perperium, including uh, psychiatric disorders during the perperium. 